Hello, New York. It's Mayor Eric Adams, and I'm excited to welcome you to the Get Stuff Done cast, where I talk to New Yorkers from all walks of life who are getting stuff done in a real way. And nothing personifies that more than the mental health crisis that we're seeing in our streets, at home, on our workplaces, all over our city, not only pre-pandemic, but post-pandemic. It's a real issue, and real people are solving the problems. You don't see them every day, but they are in front of the scene and behind the scene uh, tackling this issue. We have city employees who are doing outreach 24-7, but we also have not-for-profit partners that we work with that are doing 24-7 outreach as well. And sometimes when people think of a mental health issues or mental illness, uh, they think everyone fits into one category. And that is not true. Our real focus that we, we zeroed in on uh, last year was a particular group as we helped everyone, but we were really concerned about those who could not take care of their basic needs and they were in danger to themselves and others. So we put in place a real mental health strategy uh, to focus on this. And it was highlighted even more a few uh, weeks ago when we lost uh, Jordan Neely. It showed us how the coordination, the effort, the outreach is all part of the strategy, uh, not only to focus on how he died, but how he lived and what we need to do to ensure the other Jordans uh, that are out there can get the care and the help that they deserve. It hurts me deeply. You know, my son's name is Jordan. Uh, so I think about it all the time. And I want to do everything possible uh, to be there for those who are in need without slipping through the cracks. And so the, today I'm excited. Uh, one of my favorite commissioners Molly Park is here. She's our new commissioner of the Department of Social Services, Services and Xavier Shakespeare. You were teased a lot with that last name, weren't you? <laughs> One of our street outreach workers who's doing incredible work on the front lines of this crisis. And uh, I, I saw Xavier out in the system one day doing her thing, just conscientious, compassionate, caring, kind, all the things that you need to build trust on how to uh, really get this work done in a real in a real way. So let me, let me start with you, Commissioner. Uh, uh, first, uh, how did you get here? You know, what was the journey like? Uh, you know, what motivated you to do this work? Because you, you're not doing it because you're going to be a millionaire. <laughs> That's for sure. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I started in the affordable housing world, um, and and I really value the affordable housing world because. There's so much that you can't do if you don't have a safe and secure place to live, right? It's hard to grow educationally. It's hard to address healthcare issues. It's hard to grow financial stability if you don't have safe, affordable housing. But in New York City, the housing and homelessness sectors are really bifurcated um, historically. And I wanted to be the one, one of the people who could break down those silos and who, because people who are experiencing homelessness they may end up in our shelter system for lots of different reasons, but fundamentally what they have or what they don't have is a home, mm. right? So it is at the end of the day, homelessness is a housing issue. And I wanted to be one of the, the few people who could speak both languages. Interesting. And they almost go hand in hand because if you're dealing with this severe mental health illness, it's difficult to keep a home. It's difficult for you to be on top of the necessary uh, things that it takes to hold on to your home. And so this almost is, is an easy transition for you. Absolutely, Mr. Mayor. Um, it, it's circular. If you don't have a home, it's very hard to achieve mental health stability. And if you, but if you are struggling with mental illness, it can be very difficult to keep the home. So working with Department of Homeless Services to try and connect people to housing and then also working on the social service side to try and uh, get people the supports that they need to hang on to the housing that they have, it's really important to me. And Xavier, you out there doing some difficult work. You're on the ground. Uh, it's one thing for people who are in clean, safe, sterilized environments uh, to talk about the work that you're doing on rebuilding trust. Uh, you know, what motivated you and how did you get on this line of work, on this pathway? Well, I started out in the shelter system. I've been in the shelter system for about 10 years. Um, that was my, always my passion, social work. Mm. So I graduated with a degree in social work and okay. human services. And um, I've worked in various shelter systems from 
adults to families. I've been a DV counselor and I've also done senior, the first senior homeless shelter okay. in the city. Mm-hmm. So I was a housing specialist there. And what I was focused on was finding them housing. But I said, you know what? I want to start the beginning to figure out why they're here. So I transitioned over to DHS into the Streetless Homeless Solution. Interesting. And, and to answer that question for us, why they're here? It's a lot of issues, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of them come in and they say they don't, it's support. Mental illness is big. Mm-hmm. And just trust. You know, they don't trust the system. They don't trust anyone they come in contact with. Society in itself. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people say family. Mm-hmm. So family structure is big too. A lot of people come in and say they don't have a lot of family support. They don't have a lot of financial support. And then the housing market is another big issue. So when you, uh, by now, I'm sure that you could look at a potential client and know if it's going to be challenging or not. How do you start that initial trust building interaction? So um, I do understand that it can take us hundreds of engagements and interactions, right? Because they don't know me and I'm a stranger just like everyone else in the streets. That's a very important point that you just raised. Uh, right. People often say, well, why can't you just walk up to them and get them off the system? As, and as you stated, it takes hundreds of interactions, a lot of patience. Yes. You know, a lot of, you know, four letter words being thrown at you and you got to <laughs> just stay disciplined, you know? And so what is that interaction? Walk us through Here's a person, you clearly see that there's something wrong. They are, you know, maybe soiled clothing, maybe talking to themselves, yelling. How do you make that interaction? Well, I try to interact with each person as if I already know them, right? Because when you come stranger to, you know, a stranger walks up to you, kind of like, oh. So I'm like, hey, how are you? Nice to see you again. Even if I've never seen them again, I'm nice to see you again because they don't know. They've been on the train for or outside for a long time. How are you? My name is Xavier. I work for the Department of Homeless Services, and I want to see what I can do to help you. Can you tell me what it is that I can offer to you, what service I can offer to you that you need right now that I could give to you right now? And a lot of times they're like, you know what? I just want my own place. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. What do you mean by you want your own place? Because what we can offer to you right now, we have like the low barrier housings, like safe havens, or would you like the start of our um, welcome centers? A lot of the times we cannot start with shelter. We have to start with another option Mm -hmm. because of the misconception of how shelters are run, what they look like and what happens there. Mm -hmm. I try to start and another give them another option. So when you start there and talking about what a safe haven and stabilization and what we offer there and, you know, it's most it's not as hands on, maybe like a shelter. It's not as many people because, you know, that's an issue having a lot of people in one area. Right. So we just give them, provide them with the information. And if their clothes are soiled, now we have clothing at our station, some of our station. Nice, nice. Mm-hmm. So we can walk with them over to our closet. Hey, we have these things available for you also. And then we start off with, all right, right now, all we need is your name and date of birth. Mm-hmm. Nothing else, right? We start with the name and date of birth. We call in. We tell them what options are available. We give them multiple options. If they have a safe haven or the shelter. And we allow them to make a decision. Because a lot of times they want to make a decision on their lives. Mm, And that's understandable. The tragic reality of severe mental illness is that some who suffer from it are at times unaware of their own need for care. And all too often, they're caught up in the cycle of violence, sometimes as perpetrators or far more often as victims. In many cases, and through no fault of their own, they resist treatment, walk away from a chance for recovery, and disappear into the shadows. Top three reasons people don't go inside, based on your observation. Um, Curfew. Interesting. I don't like coming home either. You know, if they call me the nightlife man, I'm out a lot. I heard about it. Uh, we've been out together at night. <laughs> Curfew is a big thing for them. Um, wow. No one mm-hmm. wants to really be told what time to come in. So DHS has kind of, you know, been a little bit more relaxed on the curfew. We've pushed it back for okay. those shelters, mm-hmm. right? Um, they also, it's image. Okay. Mm-hmm. That so they have the shelter, in their mind? In their what, mind. Okay. Based off of their interaction with someone else they meet on the street, mm-hmm. of how shelters are run, what they look like, what happens there. And we kind of got to get clear 
and, and let them know, you know, it's not always like that. Mm-hmm. But we have other options like our safe havens and stabilization beds that are small and more intimate if you do not feel comfortable in such a, a large setting. And just the general mistrust. Mm-hmm. Okay, large level of mistrust. Large level of mistrust. So that that approach that you do is a way of bringing down that distrust. Right. Interesting. Is it different breaking down those walls of distrust based on the age of the person? Because I'm seeing more and more young people that are out there. The young people now, I wouldn't say that it's more difficult Mm -hmm. because they have more information. Mm -hmm. Our older population, they are basing it off of the old ways. Okay. So it's easier for us to get a younger person to go in, especially if it's something like um, the hotel setting. Mm -hmm. So they're like, okay. I'm going to go in. I'm not going to start off like I did at, like someone would at Bedford Atlantic, where it's a bigger right, setting. Right, right. I'm going into where it's myself and one other person, mm-hmm. and then I can have a case manager come in and work on a one-on-one. And they feel like it's more intimate. Okay. So it's easier for us to get the younger crowd right. in because they have that information. And, and Commissioner, uh, Xavier gave me three reasons why people refuse to come in. Give me three, based on your observation throughout the years, what are three of the pathways that people find themselves homeless that you found? Like, what are some of the three of the reasons that a person is homeless? I met the other day, before you answer that, I met a former, one of my former police officers who was homeless. And, you know, I, I remember walking away from him. He stopped me, he saw me, he was like, hey, you don't remember me? And we started talking, I realized who he was. And I, I wanted to ask so badly, how, what happened? So, like, what are the three top reason that you notice that people find themselves homeless? I mean, underlying all of the reasons for homelessness, I think, is the nature of the housing market and income inequality in New York City, Mm. right? We have in New York City more than half a million households who earn less than $30,000 a year and are paying more than 50% of their income in rent. So that is a very narrow definition of housing instability, and it's half a million households, right? It's so many people. Any one of those households is an emergency away from from needing shelter system, right? So that's why that that is why, and I, as you tick down the list, why it was important for us to settle a, a union contract with DC thirty seven that paid them a good wage, so they can actually stay in the city that they are building, and you know, paying our police officers a good salary. Uh, as well, in, in, in settling these contracts, where we are ensuring that it's you know our city employees, all three hundred over three hundred thousand, are able to pay you know the rent, the food, the utilities, you know. So that is a very important issue. Absolutely, whether or not you can afford your housing is a function not only of how expensive the housing is, but how much you earn, mm-hmm. right? So I think you start with this foundation of of income inequality and really high housing costs. And then you layer on, you know, a healthcare emergency, um, which could be, you know, and for some people it's, it's a behavioral health crisis, but in other cases, right, it's a physical health issue where you rack up crazy health bills, right? Mm-hmm. I think domestic violence, um, particularly for women, is a huge driver um, for shelter and mm-hmm. for, for need for our services. People think of domestic violence. You know, I grew up in a household where domestic domestic violence was present, and they think of it solely as the physical violence. But you know, economic violence is just as bad. You know, if you can't afford to leave, you're you're almost entrapped in a situation. And we have shelters that sp- that solely deal with. Uh, domestic violence cases? Yes. So the Human Resources Administration, HRA, uh, manages a domestic violence shelter system that is specifically for people, for survivors of domestic violence. But even within the DHS system, um, something like 50% of of heads of household in the family system have a domestic violence history. Mm -hmm. So I would say that is an overwhelming driver of homelessness in New York City, Um, again, layered on to the unaffordable housing market. And I think for a third reason, I mean, there are so many pathways and right. really every every household is and every client is unique. Mm-hmm. But I do think the lack of family supports that, that Xavier mentioned is is really important, right? Most of those half a million households are actually not going to come to us. But the, the people who do need our services are those for whom their their personal safety net just doesn't exist. Wow. Wow. And that's why Dr. Fasan says all the time you, that we need community. You know, we need care. 
And there's a series of things that we need to not only stabilize those who are homeless, but to stabilize uh, those who are going through a mental health illness. If you could have community and care, uh, someone is, is there to give you the support that you need. You know, now on the subway system, you're seeing, you know, sort of repeated uh, personnel, repeated clients. How do you, uh, those who have those bad experiences, how do you talk them through to, you know, come back inside? It may have been a bad experience, but we want you to come back inside. What, what are the methods that you use? When we engage with a client that um, are known to us, it's just us re-engaging and trying to figure out, okay, so last time we saw you, we placed you here. Can you tell us what was the issue? And they usually do. I like that. They usually tell us like, oh, I didn't, it was too far. Or if they do have a family, some of us do have family. It's way too far for my family. While I don't visit them too often, when I choose to, if I'm, in, if I'm placed in the Bronx and they're in Brooklyn, it just takes, it's too far out of my way. Right, right. Okay. So now we'll call back and try to find somewhere that's closer to your family unit. Got it. Mm -hmm. um, or medical or employment, mm -hmm. anything, whatever issue they have, we're just trying to figure out how can we best fix this issue. I, I remember one day we were in the subway system and I was talking to a gentleman on, on the bench. He had no shoes on. He was sitting there and we started talking and he was extremely intelligent and we were engaged. He, 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 he was able to talk about some of the the mental health challenges that he had and that your team was able to get there. And I, I love that picture. I actually have that picture in my office of the two, two of us chatting. There, there must be in all of the challenges of the job, you have to have some, some days that you say, you know what? Yes, it was a victory, you know. I do. <laughs> I have a short story. Yes. Um, I remember probably about two months ago, I was actually placing the client and escorting him to our transportation vehicle. And I can hear someone screaming, miss, miss. <laughs> and I'm like, I have to finish with this client. I'll address the client in a second. I turn as I place the client on the transportation vehicle and I'm returning. I'm like, yes, sir. How may I help? He said, do you remember me? <laughs> I'm so sorry. I engage with hundreds of clients every night. Right. I'm sorry. He says, it's okay. But I met you a few months ago and we talked and you placed me in the Bronx. And you told me, you, listen, you get there, you work with the case managers, you work at how this place, you do your part, they do their part, and you're going to move out. You're going to mm. get your own place. And he digs in his pocket, and he brings out a key, and he's shaking it. He says, I have my own apartment, and wow. I want to say thank you. So it does work. Wow, wow. Isn't that what powerful? What we're doing does work. Isn't that powerful? Absolutely. And you think about the over 4,000 people who we uh, got off the system. Some went back. You know, we're honest about it. We're transparent. Some stayed out. Some went with family members. But we didn't walk by them. We, we did not ignore them. Uh, we, did, we, we were not afraid of the challenge uh, that we were facing. And it's like those good community relationships. Like, I'm so proud of what Norman Siegel is doing with the volunteerism and the project of just being out there. He's keep building over and over again. Uh, I was at one of his recruitments with college students, and they were eager to get out there. Every day New Yorkers can do something uh, to assist their fellow New Yorkers. One of my favorite days is when on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. I go out and feed the homeless on 34th Street. I get so much out of it. But that's the relationship. How does our DSS work with community organizations and other New Yorkers uh, to get people uh, on our streets and subways to the help they need. They, I know there's some partnerships because you can't do it alone. We absolutely can't do it alone. Um, our not-for-profit partners are a really important part of what we do. We have city employees who are doing outreach 24-7, but we also have um, not-for-profit partners that we work with that are doing 24-7 outreach as well. And then, you know, we've talked already about the safe havens and the stabilization beds. Those are all operated by not-for-profit organizations. Um, one of the things that is is terrific is that we've managed to build that universe of, of these low barrier beds really significantly. Um, we've opened 800 additional beds in this administration. We've added these welcome centers. I think Xavier mentioned them. The idea there being that 
you know, when it's two o'clock in the morning and you haven't slept and you haven't showered and you haven't eaten, it's really hard to make a good decision about what your placement mm, is going right. to be. So let's get you inside and we'll sort it out in the morning. Right. So we are bringing more and more not for profits in to do to do that work, to operate those programs. And there's no way we could do any of this without them. But it goes beyond that. You mentioned the the Street Homeless Advocacy Project. We're really grateful to, for the work that Norman Siegel does to bring others into the outreach work. And then everyday New Yorkers, if you see an individual that you're concerned about, call 311, right? We get those calls and we will send out an outreach team, either DHS staff or not-for-profit staff. So this is, you know, nobody has to ignore their fellow human beings. We're all in it together and we can all work together. Yes, no, I I believe uh, that wholeheartedly. My first few months in office, going out, visiting people in encampments and tents, and I just said, I cannot walk past New York is like this, no matter how difficult uh, it is. You know, we talked um, about the importance of ensuring New Yorkers in need have access to adequate mental health services. Can you just talk about in our few moments left how we are making that happen in New York City? This is another place where we absolutely can't do it alone. We work very, very closely with our healthcare partners, both the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and H&H so that we are connecting people to the resources. Um, The State Office of Mental Health, in addition, um, we're really thrilled that the state government is really actually finally investing in services for mental health services and and eventually long-term mental health beds, which I think is incredibly important. One of the things that, that is driving what we see every day is the fact that over the last decades, right, the state has really disinvested in, in, um, in patient mental health care. So I think that's really exciting. But we're really trying to assess each client and connect them to the services. In some cases, it's actually in the safe haven, in the stabilization bed, in the shelter. But, but because the goal is permanent housing, um, we don't want people to be dependent on the services in their site. So those community referrals, whether it is with a government you know, a team, we have shelter-based ACT teams, we work with the IMT teams, or to a medical professional in the community, those referrals are really important to what we do. No, well said, well said. Uh, listen, I want to thank both of you, you know, for coming in. And, you know, you you inherited a very uh, complex time in our city, but I think history is going to look back on the two of you and your teams, the countless number of people, thousands of people are out there uh, doing the job, both for uh, city employees, as volunteers, as NGOs, as local community-based organizations, they're rolling up their sleeves and they're saying they want to help. And, you know, I'm a big believer when you deposit into the social bank of life, you could draw on equity when you need it. And I'm sure that you have, you guys have a lot of equity waiting for you when you need it. Thank you Thank so you. much. You're very Thank you. Thank you very much. And this is the information I wanted to share today. I hope to see you for another episode of Get Stuff Done Cast.